Okay, so firstly, you're all very welcome to the National University of Ireland Galway and the Moore Institute on behalf of Jason and myself. We first have to start, of course, by thanking the sponsors that have made this possible, the Irish Research Council, who have funded our project Migration, Interculturalism, and Contemporary Irish Performance, the Moore Institute, the School of Humanities, and Drama and Theatre Studies. We would also like to thank Modern Times Stage Company for the use of their image from the 2001 production Halaj by photographer John Lehner, featuring performers from left to right, Costa Tavarninsky, John Ning, Peter Farbridge. We would also like to thank as well our collaborators in making this day possible, David Brandt and Brandt Studios in the back of the room, Mike Collins and Maria Donovan at Cork University Press for their support for tomorrow's launch, colleagues and helpers including Nelson Barre, Justin, Justine Nakasaki, Martha Shaughnessy, Kate Thornhill, Tanya Dean, Miriam Houghton, Patrick Lonergan, Marianne Kennedy, Dee Quinn, Ian Walsh, Dan Carey, and Miriam O'Kennedy. So last but not least, thank you to all of you who have traveled long distances through many labyrinthine processes and procedures and encounters to be here. Brian and Emine, Julie, Joanne, Rick, Lizzie, Prachana, Victor, Yvette, Daphne, Rustam, and Leo. Uh, as Rustam reminds us, quote, interculturalism ver invariably begins with the trauma of having to attain a visa. The first <laughs> performance is with your visa officer, then the immigration officer, and I would add to that then at the drinks reception. Um, we do not take for granted your sacrifice of time and effort to come share this time reflecting with us. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague and co-editor of Staging Intercultural Ireland, um, Plays and Practitioner Perspectives, Matthew Spangler, who has traveled here to be with us. Not only traveling, bringing himself, but bringing graduate students with him as well. So, Melanie, you're very welcome here. And for everyone from NUIG or other institutions who are here, thank you for coming out on this beautiful and rare the sunny Friday morning. <laughs> so, here we go. Okay. This event must be situated in two contexts. First, as a response to what we perceive as a renewed debate in theater and performance studies regarding the term interculturalism and intercultural theater since the late 2000s and early 2010s. This will come as no surprise to many in this room who have been the key theoretical architects of this recent re-examination. And secondly, growing out of our own research on the adoption of interculturalism in an Irish context from social policy and aesthetic perspectives since the mid-1990s. The Irish turn towards interculturalism followed a period of unprecedented inward migration at that, at that time brought on by the Celtic Tiger economic boom, among other factors. In less than 20 years, the Republic of Ireland went from less than 5% non-Irish born in 1996 to a 17% non-Irish born population according to the 2011 census. So our research project, Migration, Interculturalism, and Contemporary Irish Performance asks, what happens when the arts are called upon to further and reflect state goals of interculturalism as opposed to multiculturalism, a more familiar state policy paradigm? What emergent identities become possible within Irish discourses of interculturalism for both majority and minority ethnic members of Irish society? Our goal here will be in this opening address to firstly lay out the more recent theoretical genealogy that led us to ask interculturalism and performance now, new directions, and then to briefly explore the Irish case study. So part one is interculturalism and performance now, new directions. One of the most fiercely debated terms of contemporary performance theory, Julie Hollage and Joanne Tompkins write, rightly designated interculturalism in 2000, quote, a theoretical, theatrical, and cultural minefield. Interculturalism took on meaning as a discursive formation through its circulation within Western academic discourse from the 1970s onwards, although it was quickly deployed to reflect on the practice of earlier theatrical modernists, including Antonin Artaud, Bertolt Brecht, Edward Gordon Craig, William Butler Yeats, and others. Interculturalism and its more genre-specific counterpart intercultural, uh, uh, intercultural theater would take on an almost nuclear charge that built to a climax, particularly through sustain, sustained debates 
over Peter Brooks's Mahabharata that began in the late 1980s and raged through to the end of the 1990s. As Baruka puts it succinctly, quote, the practice of interculturalism cannot be separated from the larger history of Orientalism into which it is inscribed. Described variously as, quote, the synthesis of heterogeneous traditions, Kavi, quote, a hybrid derived from an intentional encounter between cultures and performing traditions, Lowe and Gilbert, or, quote, the phenomenon by which diverse cultures are exchanged, transported, and appropriated across nations, Barucha, interculturalism's critical purchase as a theoretical paradigm had arguably peaked by the early 2000s after vociferous debates over the ethics of its staging, casting, and collaborative practices in regards to its typical operations of unequal exchange across east-west or north-south axes. By this time, intercultural theater had become synonymous with the works of artists including, quote, Peter Brook, Ariane Nuchkin, Richard Schechner, and their eastern counterparts, Suzuki Tadashi of Japan, the contemporary legend theater of Japan, and to a certain extent, Ong Kang Sen of Singapore, end quote, whose work exemplifies what Daphne Lee calls, quote, hegemonic intercultural theater, a specific artistic genre and state of mind that combines first world capital and brain power with third world raw material and labor and Western classical texts with Eastern performances, end quote. Lee identifies HIT key components as, quote, elitism and vast capital that are crucial to this form, international festivals, master directors, traditional artists with the stature of living national treasures, academic sponsorship, and intellectual discourse that all contribute to the hegemony of this type of intercultural theater. In his 2011 acoustic interculturalism, listening to performance, Marcus Cheng Che Tan argues, quote, intercultural theater as Western performance discourse defined by Western theoretical frameworks is experiencing an evolution. Now to slightly contradict that, as early as 2002, Una Chowdhury had celebrated a quote, new interculturalism in the work of scholars, including Julie Hollidge, Joanne Tompkins, Rusin Barucha, and Johannes Berenger. This cluster of work had begun at that time in the early 2000s to challenge the paradigm of what Hollidge and Tompkins called taxonomic intercultural theater, defined by them as, quote, simplistically demarcating the boundaries between cultures, end quote. The late 2000s and early 2010s, however, would intensify this examination of the new interculturalism and nuance it even further in works including most prominently Rick Knoll's Theater and Interculturalism in 2010, which explicitly deploys the term new interculturalism among his other articles and volumes on this topic, including Ethnic, Multicultural, and Intercultural Theater, co-edited with Ingrid Mundell, a winter 2011 issue of Theater Journal titled Rethinking Intercultural Performance, edited again by Rick Knowles, along with Penny Farfan, and featuring work by Leo Cabranes Grant, Diana Lucer, Katerina Jakubiak, Daphne <coughs> Lay, William Peterson, and Jay Lorenzo Perilla. This is all joined by recent articles by Yvette Hutchison here with us, San San Quan, Patrice Pavi, among others, including ourselves. However, to complicate it further, the term has also recently been rechallenged and newly rejected by Erica Fischer Lichta and her collaborators in the Center for Interweaving Performance Cultures at the Free University of Berlin, and in her collection, quote, uh, sorry, The Politics of Interweaving Performance Cultures Beyond Postcolonialism, edited with Torsten Jost and Saskia Iris Jan. We'll return to some of her ideas on interweaving later at the conclusion of our talk. In the introduction to their 2011 Theater Journal special issue, Farfan and Knowles suggest, quote, there is room for more globally syncretic and historically grounded understandings of intercultural performance as something that did not begin or end with Western modernism and that does not simply involve Western appropriations of the other, end quote. Knowles also asks in theater and interculturalism, what would it mean to apply the more recent insights of the newly configured performance studies of critical multiculturalism, critical race theory, and whiteness studies, diaspora studies, and new cosmopolitanism to the field of intercultural performance, end quote. The wave of so-called new interculturalisms we have gathered to investigate picks up precisely on these interdisciplinary strands as pointed out by Knowles. Scholars operating broadly within this perhaps shifted paradigm stretch the meaning of interculturalism and intercultural theater both in their aesthetic context and social context in recognition in the words of Daphne Lay, 
intercultural theater has diversified and multiplied as the discourse has been enriched and complicated by other pressing issues like gender, diaspora, <coughs> ethnicity, and globalization. This move picks up on the 2002 claim of Jacqueline Lowe and Helen Gilbert that, quote, it might be possible to explore the rhizomatic potential of interculturalism, its ability to make multiple connections and disconnections between cultural spaces, and to create representations that are unbounded and open and potentially resistant to forms of imperialist closure, end quote. Significant strands that might be grouped under what Knowles claims as the new interculturalism and that will be represented by presentations over the course of this symposium include historical approaches to intercultural performance, indigeneity and interculturalism, Asian and other oppositional models of interculturalism that challenge and or reify Western hegemonies, the use of interculturalism within migrant performance cultures and connected to this, interculturalism as aesthetic practice and social policy in the European Union and Canada. Knowles claims that the new interculturalism, quote, involves collaborations and solidarities across real and respected material differences within local, urban, national, and global intercultural performance ecologies. He asserts that ultimately these performance ecologies, quote, do not function merely as sites of semiotic intersection or as postmodern collages, but as politicized sites for the constitution of new hybrid and diasporic identities in space. This symposium tests Knowles's particular claims for the new interculturalism through an engagement with the past, present, and future of interculturalism's aspirations and failures as a critical paradigm and performance practice. It is these tensions that we will explore in our time together, although as ever, this time may only be enough to scratch the surface. And now, to Ireland by way of Moore Street Masala. So the second part of our talk is entitled Intercultural Ireland. David O'Sullivan's 2009 short film, Moore Street Masala, reimagines an afternoon in the life of urban Dublin as a Bollywood dance number waiting to happen. Set on Moore Street on the north side of Dublin in the inner city, this film tells the story of a South Asian convenience store clerk named Baba, played by Diva Naidu, who falls in love with a white woman, played by Anna Wilson working as a secretary across the way at a real estate office. Despite warnings from his boss, he serenades her with song, finally winning her after battling a field of menacing real estate signs that ominously promise consumers they can buy now, worry later, a reference to the property bubble that precipitated the 2008 collapse of the Irish Celtic Tiger economy. <laughs> Hey. She is high class businesswoman. You are nothing. Oh, yeah, Pyar Karan, Mosam Karan, Vak Bita Jai, Reshmi Baal, Skim Kiya Kama. Baba, inside. Now. Cigarettes, chocolates, munchies, newspapers, bog roll, barrel, pesto and papers, Ajax, cat food, tampak and razor. I'm bored shitless, how can I face her? Girl, I need you, bring on your healing, baby, you know it, feel what I'm feeling. <laughs> Yeah. 
unexpected by by bleeding sound. But hatches later, she is around. Everybody's saying it's senseless. The better day boy and a princess. I'm in a state agent on the way up. You're just a minimum wage pup. You want me to match your flash? Where am I going to get that kind of cash? What do you think I am? Money don't make the man. There you are. I'm still waiting for you to type up the Miller contract. Yes, sir, Mr. Gannon. I'll get to it right now. I'm not paying you to sing. <laughs> You're a hot property, finger kind of scary. You ain't nothing but secretary. Don't want you, don't need your pity. Ain't you ever seen sex in the city? You can be what you want to be. You know, come into my fantasy. registers the rapid social change experienced by Ireland since the mid-1990s. Initial inward migration patterns, as we said, were driven by the Celtic Tiger economic boom that lasted from, 2000, from the late 1990s until the collapse of the Irish economy in 2008. Migrants have been drawn to Ireland first by the short-lived but intense prosperity of this period, but also they were drawn by the accession of several new state, uh, member states to the European mm -hmm. Union in 2004 and 2007, including Poland and Lithuania, who have contributed the most sizable portion of Ireland's Eastern European minority ethnic community. The new Irish, as they are called by Brian Fanning, are a diverse group of more than 196 nationalities, with the largest minority ethnic groups including Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian, Nigerian, and Romanian migrants, and actually Indians being cited as one of the fastest growing communities in the last census. Following the crash, emigration levels have risen, of course, and inward migration has slowed, but the new social diversity will be a lasting legacy of this period. When the tide turned, we quickly adopted here interculturalism as the key word of social policy at the governmental level, a term that consequently circulated more widely among NGOs, activists, and migrant-led organizations. Ireland's social policy aspiration towards interculturalism reflected a wider European flirtation with the term as a, as a key word of policy rhetoric due to the perceived or alleged failure of multiculturalism as social framework. The European ascendance of interculturalism is reflected in documents including the 2007 European Commission's Agenda for Culture in a Globalizing World, the Council of Europe's 2008 White Paper on Intercultural Dialogue, Living Together as Equals in Dignity, and the mounting of the 2008 European Year of Intercultural Dialogue. So if multiculturalism is stereotypically charged with striation and division, interculturalism promises to alleviate this condition through emphasis instead on, quote, participation, 
mutual understanding and fostering a quote, active sense as European as opposed to other citizenship. Uh, and as well as pursuing dialogue as another core value and practice. In Ireland, therefore, interculturalism must be examined as a social policy driven and aesthetic mode of identity formation. And More Street Masala puts this struggle to song. More Street Masala at first appears to enact principles of intercultural performance as traditionally understood, namely the quote meeting in the moment of performance of two or more cultural traditions as Hollage and Tompkins define it. In offering a performance where indiv individual cultures meet most meaningfully in the moment of performance, More Street Masala might be read as manifesting a weak and tokenistic Irish multiculturalism, where majority and minority ethnic individuals live in isolation from one another, as indeed dramatized by Baba's initial fear of speaking to his crush when she first comes into his shop, and can only meet through heightened fantasy. The film's setting on Dublin's Moore Street and its subtle undertones of class politics challenges, though does not resolve, this baseline reading. Linked with traditional working class Dublin and home to the city's oldest daily open air food market, Moore Street was named for a family of 16th century ad adventurous planters who crossed from England to make their fortune at the expense of the native Irish. In 1916, it became a crucial battleground during the Easter Rebellion which ultimately led to the foundation of an independent Irish state in 1921. Moore Street long formed part of the working class inner city neighborhoods that characterized Dublin's north side, but during the 1990s, the area attracted large numbers of immigrants who came to redefine it. According to Patrick uh, Lonergan, quote, the area is now seen as symbolizing Dublin's nascent multiculturalism featuring as it does large numbers of shops that cater to the city's African, Asian, and Eastern European populations. Moore Street's layered history, named as a memorial to colonial planters, a center of working class life, a key site of the rebellion in 1916 and the struggle for Irish independence, resonates at both a local and national level as an urban setting that associates Dublin's nascent multiculturalism with the founding ideals of the Irish state and lasting legacies of colonialism. The seeming incongruity of performing Moore Street Masala in such an iconic setting is precisely what is arresting and thought-provoking about the film. It could be interpreted as an act of reclamation of received national memory in the name of a nascent intercultural identity. The recasting of the Irish nation's foundational narratives from the perspective of its minority ethnic and economically marginalized populations. Implicit in Moore Street Masala is the question of how national and multi-intercultural ideals and performance styles interact, coalesce, and diverge from one another. Although directed by Irish director David O'Sullivan and co-written with Irish-born Rodney Lee, O'Sullivan himself was inspired by the genre by watching the weekly subtitled Indian film in the Middle East in the 80s while living abroad. Philippines-born, Dublin-based Don King Rongavila choreographed the film, while Cormac Breslin and Deslin Quinn of the Dublin band The Republic of Luce, who themselves fuse rock, funk, and soul in their hybrid band of popular music, scored the music for the film. Moore Street Masala makes visible the collision of what could be termed the old and the new interculturalisms within theater and performance studies from an Irish perspective. If old interculturalism described the melding or fusion of performance forms from distinct cultures, usually according to an east-west or north-south axis, the new interculturalism more recently circulating is invested in the possibility of a multinodal and, quote, rhizomatic, multiple, non-hierarchical, horizontal interculturalism, perf intercultural performance from below, end quote in Rick Knowles's words. He elaborates that the new interculturalism, quote, no longer retains a West and the rest binary. It's no longer dominated by charismatic white men or performed for audiences assumed to be monochromatic or depending on the, quote, urban centers in the West or elsewhere, rating traditional forms seem to be preserved in more primitive or authentic rural settings. And finally, quote, no longer focuses on the individual performances or projects of a single artist or group, end quote. 
More Street Aspiration stages, More Street Masala stages the aspirations of this new intercultural performance from below through its dramaturgy of contact among major, minority and majority ethnic communities living in Dublin through the globalized hybrid genre of Bollywood. But if More Street Masala represents the fantasy of Irish social interculturalism, what is the reality? To examine this more closely, we're going to turn briefly to how resources have been allocated for the project of an emergent Irish social and aesthetic interculturalism. We take our cue again from Rick Knowles, who, analyzing his own critical trajectory in theater and interculturalism on its final page, writes, quote, but what haunts this inquiry and is never fully acknowledged as I move from pessimism to optimism is the historical and ongoing fact of material differences in access, funding, and resources that prevent the emerging and newly vital practices of intercultural theater that I have been describing from taking their full and proper places on the main stages of world cities with formerly marginalized and colonized people in full control of their own representation and cultural negotiations and with their cultural integrity not static but intact, end quote. This ongoing tension between intercultural artistic aspiration and economic provision is especially visible in the Irish context. The 2009 publication of the Cultural Diversity and the Arts Report, jointly commissioned by the Arts Council and CREATE, our national agency for collaborative arts, signaled theoretically a new commitment by the Irish state to be more inclusive in its resource allocation to the arts. Notably, Rusin Barucha was a consultant on this project, so they knew who to go to for the best expert. The report recognized, quote, the scarcity of opportunities for professional development for, for practitioners from minority backgrounds, which creates a system of perpetuated exclusion. Practitioners are unable to refine their practice in order to produce work perceived as sufficiently high quality and therefore cannot bring their work to critical attention. As a result, minority communities do not see themselves represented in the arts. The broader lack of participation leads to a perpetuated lack of representation. Moreover, the report found, quote, that minority ethnic arts practitioners born in Ireland have limited opportunities to present work as Irish and are often restricted to descriptions of their heritage, end quote. The lack of cultural diversity in Irish artistic production was thus attributed both to blocked mobility and restricted pathways for the professionalization of minority mm -hmm. ethnic artists, and a broader lack of engagement in arts management with minority ethnic communities and their various forms of cultural expression. The report insisted upon, quote, the need to reconsider what constitutes Irishness and by extension, arts practice in light of the experience and self-perception of migrant and minority ethnic communities and practitioners. And I distinguish there between migrant and minority ethnic practitioners because although, of course, migration accelerated in the mid-1990s, we had had long-standing minority ethnic communities, including African and Chinese people living in Ireland. So at root, the cultural diversity and the arts report um, suggested that, quote, a conceptualization of arts practice that is singularly focused on a perceived Western tradition needs to be broadened and challenged, end quote. The publication of the cultural diversity and the arts report coincided, however, with the collapse of Ireland's Celtic tiger economy in 2008-2009 that occasioned drastic cuts in the country's arts budget rather than the targeted support for minority ethnic artists and communities that it had recommended. Its conceptualization of interculturalism also took place in a context in which Irish arts and social policy were becoming increasingly conflated. In an interview with Erika Fischer-Lichte in 2011, Rustam Barukcha recollected that his experience of consulting for the report had given him a better sense of how the term interculturalism is, quote, being appropriated by governments of different nation states for all kinds of official reasons. He declared that, quote, I had a very real opportunity to test the political uses of the term when I was in Ireland working on a consultancy dealing with cultural diversity in the arts. Now that Ireland itself has a large population of peoples from other cultures and ethnicities, it also needs a policy to engage with their condition. Tellingly, this policy is framed specifically under the name of the intercultural. So at an official level, you have an intercultural policy for education, the police force, sports, health, etc. But in effect, the so-called intercultural is doing the work of the multicultural. As the two categories get conflated, 
What happens to the intercultural, as it is commonly understood, within the framework of arts and culture, interpersonal relations, and civil society? What is being excluded here? End quote. These questions continue to resonate, not only in Ireland, but also in current debates about the relation between minority communities and the state, and the role of the aesthetic and the social in the conceptualization of interculturalism and intercultural theatre more generally. Yet the scope for intercultural dialogue and exchange in Irish arts, interpersonal relations, and civil society appears even more constricted now than when Borucha had examined it. The combination of constrained resources and state appropriation has led to a situation in which interculturalism in Ireland is increasingly perceived to have failed. Moreover, this liberatory and grassroots-led Irish discourse of interculturalism was appropriated and sidelined by the state in its attempt to bypass a so-called British model of, of multiculturalism for its perceived failures. But in doing so, Ireland abdicated on a period of structural investment in the targeted support of minority ethnic groups in the arts or otherwise. In contrast, in Canada, as Knowles and Mundell argue, multicultural arts funding was designed to manage rather than promote difference. Their critique of multiculturalism as a policy that ghettoized while still funding artists nevertheless takes place in a context where minority ethnic artists enjoyed a certain level of state support and recognition. Irish social interculturalism therefore repackages the, promise, the promises of interculturalism as imagined by Barucha in its most critical mode as a promise empty of significant resources and sustained financial support. This has meant that Irish aesthetic interculturalism, as measured through theatre and performance practice, has been caught in a state of arrested development, with individual artists and companies who address themes related to migration and interculturalism working on a spectrum from the community to the professional level, but tending not to receive mainstream recognition or success. Nowhere is the failure of Irish interculturalism more evident than in its most notorious theatrical case study. The controversy surrounding the uh, 2007 new version <coughs> of Playboy of the Western World by John Millington Singh, by Irish-born novelist and playwright Roddy Doyle, and Nigerian-born playwright and director B.C. Adigan. This was commissioned for the centenary of the play's premiere in 2007 and was presented again in 2008, 2009, before leading to a protracted legal dispute over changes to the script in its second production and rights not having been paid to BC Adigan. This collaboration between a white Irish born and minority ethnic practitioner had intended to update this canonical play within a modern multiracial Irish setting. Their new version of Playboy of the Western World transformed the character of Irish Christy Mahan uh, on the run from killing his oppressive father to Nigerian Christopher Malamo, who has arrived in Dublin from Nigeria to do the same and seek harbor with a cousin. On the one hand, Doyle and Adigan's Playboy in partnership with the Abbey used this Nigerian Irish spin on what is arguably Irish modern theater's most well-known and adapted play to make a statement that minority ethnic and migrant artists and individuals would be central in defining what the next century of Irish theater practice might look like. Yet their faithful adaptation of this text where Christie and his resurrected father must leave the community to which he has fled, in this case leaving Ireland and going back to Nigeria, is a story of premature and shallow acceptance that cannot accommodate Christopher and his father as more than plot devices or give them leave to remain in Ireland. Now, this Playboy came out of a very public partnership that had actually predated this particular production. Um, Roddy Doyle in 2004 had in fact launched Arambe, Ireland's first African-Irish theater company of which BC is artistic director, but it culminated then in this acrimonious legal battle. The case was settled on January 30th, 2013, out of court with an agreement that Roddy Doyle would sign over all of his rights to the play and that the Abbey would pay approximately 40,000 euro in royalties for both of its productions to BC Adigan, as well as its own and his legal costs, which approximated 500,000 euro. Before this dispute, 
Adigan had contended that, quote, Playboy was the, quote, epitome of a perfect synergy of creativity rooted in two distinct cultures, one that, quote, would definitely not have been such a unique play if it was written by either myself or Roddy Doyle single-handedly. He called it, quote, the epitome of a genuine interculturalism in creative writing, end quote. His definition of interculturalism and the reality of its practice, however, seems to have failed to acknowledge unequal power relations and collaborations between minority and majority ethnic artists and, and balance that made this legal battle so acrimonious, symbolic, and eventually costly. This incident is symptomatic of Irish social and aesthetic interculturalism overreaching and actually perpetuating inequality through individuals and institutions, not acknowledging the relationship between structural support and power and the practices that it, that it generates. So dialogue is not enough to actually overcome that. Playboy of the Western world mirrored then this failure of Irish interculturalism to move beyond this phase of premature and shallow acceptance. Certainly, in the words of Charlotte McIver and Matthew Spangler, quote, while Adigan and Doyle's The Playboy of the Western World may be the most high profile and indeed controversial Irish theater production on the themes of inward migration and interculturalism, it is far from the only one, end quote. The scope of Irish practice in this area by migrant, minority, ethnic, and majority ethnic theater practitioners lies outside of our brief introduction, but McIver and Spangler's edited collection to be launched tomorrow gathers together the practice of companies and artists, and we can also direct you to a bibliography and production history on the website for this project. We have focused here on the Playboy controversy as it most neatly exemplifies the disjunction between Irish intercultural ideals and social realities. The language of Irish interculturalism <coughs> ultimately masks a disinvestment by the state in st structural responses to increased cultural diversity. Irish interculturalism originating in the name of the state hinders the emergence of interculturalism as a minority and grassroots-led horizon of possibility, but does not defeat it entirely. Ronit Lenton argued in 2012, for example, that, quote, the 436 migrant-led associations identified by the Trinity Migrant Network, Network Project resist rather than accept cultural governmentalities and enact their own modes of integration from below, as migrants forced to appropriate state discourses make integration work in new and exciting ways. She elaborates that, quote, the rhetoric of artistic collaboration and community involvement that predominates the discourse about culture in the intercultural age make visible the social inequalities upheld by harmonized, restrictive European Union immigration policies while at the same time generating cultural capital to fuel bottom-up cultural productions. The Irish example illustrates the manner in which state and individual agendas of interculturalism operate in an ever more complicated and entangled manner at the beginning of the 21st century. While the term has been reclaimed by Knowles, Barucha, and others, it has also been claimed more aggressively by various states, most prominently Ireland, and supranational organizations, including the Council on Europe. These claims of state purchase on interculturalism have been actually largely rhetorical, but illustrate the need for theater and performance scholars to consider how aesthetic and social interculturalisms operate in tandem in layered and contradictory ways. This wider, uh, this wider state-led appropriation of the concept of interculturalism internationally, also in Quebec as another prominent example, suggests that we need to distinguish carefully between interculturalism's possibilities and its imbrications from both above and below. We may now see a possibility of a horizon of possibility beyond hegemonic intercultural theater, but face reckoning with newly state-defined hegemonic ideals, as in Ireland, that collapse the distinction between interculturalism from above and below in performance, practice, and beyond. So to close, we move to the idea of critical utopias, a response to this. We opened by considering how Moore Street Masala stages the collision of old and new interculturalisms on the palimpsestic surface of Moore Street. Moore Street Masala succeeds in what it imagines as being made possible through performance, the forging of cross-cultural solidarities forming from the bottom up and resulting in a transformative shared practice. In this way, the film embodies a spirit of Jill Dolan's utopian performative, which springs 
from a, quote, complex alchemy of form and content, context and location, which takes shape in moments of utopia as doings, as process, as never finished gestures towards a potentially better future, end quote. Of course, it does so in a partial way. It is a citation of Bollywood that arguably stays quite near the surface. Celia As Asavara positions it as a citation of a citation in the parallels between its final dance sequence and that of the runaway mainstream success, Slumdog Millionaire, directed, coincidentally or not, by British director Danny Boyle, who's of Irish descent. And although it features a cast that is racially and ethnically diverse, and contains a subtle critique of Ireland's financial markets through its references to the housing bubble, all characters will return to their social roles limited by the structures of class and practices of institutional racism in contemporary Ireland when the number concludes. So can we still say that this short film points us towards utopia staged on the site where old and new interculturalisms seem to collide? Utopia comes up as a key term across the literature on interculturalism and intercultural theater from the 70s to now, both implicitly and explicitly. It is implicit in calls for the crafting of a shared world culture or accessible grammar of transcultural theater achieved by particular projects through a blending of many forms. Rusin Barucha criticizes his particular stance as, quote, breezy utopian universalism that is often reduced to a pre-existing beneficent beneficent state of being, end quote, that particularly, sorry, continuing quote, that particularly dismisses the political importance of the nation state as a site of liberation, particularly in a post-colonial context and limiting center of control, end quote. Utopia has been invoked more recently by Rick Knowles and Erica fischer Lichta in her defense of interweaving performance cultures. Knowles meditates on interculturalism as fraught territory, quote, centrally implicated in genealogies of cultural imperialism, appropriation, and colonization, even as it offers the utopian promise of a world where race and cultural differences do not matter, end quote. Fischer Lichta reaches towards utopia, insisting, like Dolan, that, quote, in performance, new forms of social coexistence may be tried out or they may simply emerge, end quote. She elaborates the quote, processes of interweaving performance cultures can and quite often do provide an experimental framework for experiencing the utopian potential of culturally diverse and globalized societies by realizing an aesthetic which gives shape to unprecedented collaborative policies in society. By permanently probing the emergent stabilization and destabilization of cultural identities, these performances can transfer their participants into states of in-betweenness, which allow them to anticipate, anticipate a future within the journey itself. The permanence of transition and the state of liminality is indeed constitutive of their experience. What is perceived as an aesthetic experience in these performances will be experienced as everyday life in the future." End quote. Fischer Lichta's embrace of utopian liminality invests hope in the political future as something that can be conjured and experienced through performance, even only as a mode of dreaming. Dolan concurs, quote, I find this notion very rich, the idea that in order to pretend to enact an ideal future, a culture has to move further and further away from the real into a kind of performative, in which the utterance in this case doesn't necessarily make it so, but inspires perhaps other more local doings that sketch out the potential in those feignings, end quote. But utopia is also a problematic concept when to invoke it erases the networks that precondition the circumstances for its possible creation in whatever temporarily or permanently constituted, quote, publics that create themselves anew for each performance. The new interculturalism, as we've laid out in this talk, reaches perhaps towards the mapping of a series of critical utopias in which publics and scholars alike must, in the words of Leo Cabranes Grant, quote, support our analysis of intercultural scenarios with a wider acknowledgement of the networks of production that articulate them, scenarios which often occur in networks originating from below that act horizontally and that may disappear in the very moment after they coalesce, end quote. These critical utopias are sites of hope, but also duress, unmaking as well as becoming, spaces of failure as well as productive imagining. Dolan and Fischer Lichte embrace the utopian performative as a site of liminal deferral that dreams what it cannot yet grasp or embodies for fleeting moments what is only evanescently possible. 
but as Barucha offers in another context, engaging with the work of philosopher Ruth Levitas, quote, what is needed are not better maps of the future, but more adequate maps of the present, which can inspire the most effective means of activating the desire for a more humane world. We are invested in exploring through this symposium how a new interculturalism might powerfully balance politically and methodologically the demand to map past, present, and future through engaging within the crucibles of performative utterances, utopian for their successes or dystopian in their failures, but rarely one or the other. Recently revised theorizations of the intercultural performance draw our attention anew to the networks through which power circulates by demanding continuous oscillation in our understanding of the spectrum of agency conferred or available within intercultural scenarios and processes. We've not moved beyond HIT, but rather need to remind ourselves to look not only constantly above but below and examine all the sites and moments on the network in between, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that culture is not a repertoire, repertoire of essentialized group identities, but individual practices, both limited and defiant of borders of nation, com community, and self. Thank you. So that's where we're trying to go. Um, so we've started a few minutes late, and one of our next distinguished panelists actually has to catch a flight immediately after his panel. Um, so we'll perhaps hold questions till the end of this session, and then if people have questions for Jason and I, they can pose them at this time, and we'll be returning to the Irish example tonight in the performance as well, okay? So I'll invite up uh, Dan Carey as chair of the next panel and, and our speakers, and we'll set up your tech. Okay, I think we'll get started now with our, our first uh, panel of interculturalism and performance now. Our first speaker is Brian Singleton. Brian will be known to many people here. He's uh, Samuel Beckett Professor of Drama and Theater, uh, and he's also the Academic Director of the Lear, which is the National Academy of Dramatic Art at Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, Brian has published widely on theater and performance practice in Irish and European contexts. His particular interest in interculturalism and Orientalism, gender, and memory. Uh, in addition to that, he's former editor of uh, Theatre Research International and former president of the International Federation for Theatre Research. In 2012, he and Janelle Reinelt won the ATHG Excellence in Editing Award for their book series, Studies in International Performance. So Brian's going to speak today on censorship and sensitivities, the representation of otherness on and off the British stage. We have a second speaker I'll introduce when she comes up and we'll take questions at the end. So, Brian. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just go straight in. Okay. Um, on the British stage in the time of empire, when binaries of us and them appeared on the surface to be watertight, and the representation of otherness appeared to be sanctioned and glorified, little attention was paid in print media to the role of censorship in respect of the sensitivities of cultural and religious differences of Britain's theatre-going population. An analysis of the popular representations of Orientalism, for instance, belie the interventions behind the scenes and prior to opening nights of the actual subjects of otherness themselves, whose images and cultures were to be misrepresented for popular entertainment. And while the jingoistic triumphalism of pantomime and melodrama, and in some instances in musical comedy, became the popular cultural face of expansionist imperialism, the anxieties of the British establishment about the performance of empire, and in particular, the performance of race, ethnicity, and religion from a political perspective, served as a little known counterpoint narrative lurking in the wings, terrified of upset, destabilization, and offense. And working through those anxieties was the office of the Lord Chamberlain, whose job it was to mediate between theater producers Whose, and whose aim was to capitalise on the populist propaganda in representation on the London stages in particular, and, on the other side, notions of public decency, immorality, and religious offence to the other. 
Now, I've written about all the, this before, um, it, about British Orientalism before, first in uh, the monograph, Oscar Rash, Orientalism and British Musical Comedy, and also an essay in Charlotte Canning and Tom Postlewaite's book, Representing the Past. And I, and I return to it again um, because I believe the contemporary moment, with its calls for freedom of expression and demands for censoriousness, if not outright censorship, needs historical perspectives, albeit in a period of Orientalism on the stage, rather than intercultural encounters in a post-colonial and globalized world. The politics of representing the other and its otherness is ground that has been well covered, as we know, from the 1980s. But for me, what is most interesting now is to go behind the performances and examine the contestation of the rights of artists um, and their opponents to express themselves off stage, not just in the contemporary world, where social media accelerates the notion of a right to freedom of expression, but to an earlier colonial period where there were no such rights and, where epist and when epistolary communication would often find its way to contesting perceived offence to particularly religious sensitivities in formal terms. Now, moving to the historical might appear problematic in a forum such as this, focusing on interculturalism and performance now. And so I want to pause briefly on why I've chosen to, to historicize. When theories of interculturalism began to emerge and gain traction within performance studies in the early 1980s, it was within a positivist outlook on cultural otherness and a stretching of the boundaries of disciplinary inquiry that occluded the political ramifications of what I termed at the time the pursuit of otherness for the investigation of self. The users of the new term, interculturalism, sought to distance it from its predecessor, Orientalism, and from the latter's sonography of otherness on the surface of cultures, and emphasized instead an anthropological turn in the roots of ritual, in its quest to drive the performative avant-garde in new directions. Now, more than three decades later, in a post-global world of supermodernity, interculturalism is a t as a term and performative practice seem to be confined to history, as well as uh, its neo-orientalist practices of the 1980s and 90s, which we were warned about by Rustam uh, earlier. And while a new term came to light, courtesy of Erke Fischer-Lichte's uh, uh, Fischer notion of interweaving, which at the very first iteration appeared apolitical, not anymore, a new interest in the original term emerged. Now, what interests me still um, with the term 20 years on from writing about the practice in that east-west axis of what Daphne Lay in 2011 termed hegemonic international in, uh, intercultural theatre lies in migrant representation and participation in diasporic European performance contexts <coughs> in the 20th and 21st centuries. From the elites of, of colonized cultures who brought to the heart of European empires religions and cultures that would both collude with and contest colonial representation, to the non-elite economic and other migrants of the late 20th century and early 21st century, whose very presence in performance challenges political narratives of European states and their rhetoric of intercultural inclusion versus their exceptional practices of segregation. So why look back in a why now context? Because present and past intercultural concerns stem from migrancy in its various guises. Much late 20th century European intercultural theatre has been literally tied to migrancy. Take Ariane Munishkin's Théâtre du Soleil, for example, where scholars such as me have primarily focused on the subjects of representation, largely their Asian contexts, with reimagined plastic and corporeal forms of representation. Um, no one has specifically examined the makeup of the company during the past 35 years of that intercultural project. Many of her company members at the time period have been composed of performers who have trod well-established migrancy routes of elite and not-so-elite artists, journeying back and forth along the old <coughs> colonial routes to, of empire to the centres. Featuring multicultural casts, the performance of otherness in material terms belonged to no one tradition of any actor. Journeying on the surface of cultures were journeying performers, simulating the other along the axis of the postmodern and the intercultural for the benefit of supranational consumer elites, such as myself. But not all of Munishkin's productions have merely performed otherness. Her 1995 Le Tartuffe, for instance, cinegraphically set in a North African country, uh, transposed primarily through inference the extreme Jansenist hypocrisy of the eponymous character to a young radical Muslim. 
Though no reference to Islam was made in the production, the danger of such an inference led to spectators being frisked and searched upon entering the auditorium, something that the ethos of the company actually abhorred. The frisk search was a sign of the acknowledgement of the potential offence of the transposition of the play to North Africa. And all critics read um, the easy sign as intended. In subsequent interviews, Manushkin defended her transposition of Jansenism to Islamism thus. I'm revolted by the duplicity of Western countries when they continue to negotiate in the name of economic and political realism with all those states all over the world that assume the right to enslave women, to kill intellectuals, artists, students, journalists, all the mouthpieces. Western countries are all Tartuffe and Organ. Performing and speaking 20 years before the Islamic terror attacks on the journalists of the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, her production was in direct response to the then recent murder of a Nigerian journalist. But it was produced in an era of first and second generation Maghrebi migrants who had lived under official government integrationist policies of assimilation of French values and cultures, multiculturalism. Ten years later, and concentrating in the banlieue, and ironically, the etymology of banlieue is banni du lieu, banished from the place. What do you expect? The policy had been abandoned, and the doubling of the Maghrebi population, that it was again to redouble by 2015, became increasingly isolated in terms of education, their religion, and also in terms of the job market, and thus became a fertile ground for the radicalization of young people. Munishkin's call for the freedom of expression came at a time after the 1989 fatwa on Salman Rushdie and, and before the 2001 attacks in the USA, when Islamic groups such as Al-Qaeda were not significantly operational, was replicated 20 years on in the Je suis Charlie protests, defending the rights of freedom of expression regardless of religious sensitivities. As the Je suis Charlie protest message went viral, so the corollary of sensitivity in pluralist societies comes under the spotlight. And this brings me to Britain. Some news channels, uh, while censoring the propaganda of Islamic State by refusing to broadcast their atrocities, also refused to broadcast the very images that provoked the Charlie Hebdo attack in the first place. Sensitivities to otherness, particularly in relation to Islam and other religions, of its diasporic second and third generation migrants have dogged British media in the past 20 years. However, as I aim to discover, this is certainly not a new phenomenon and not one principally rooted in a post-imperial society. British playwright uh, Gurpreet Kaur Bhatti is, a well -known, um, is well known for the controversy surrounding her play Bejti, it means dishonor, that was pulled from the Birmingham Rep um, in December 2004 after major protests and demonstrations from the Sikh community because the play contained scenes, scenes of rape and murder inside a Sikh temple. The author had a clear message um, uh, to the Sikh community in the program note to the play and I quote, clearly the fallibility of human nature means that the simple Sikh principles of equality, compassion and modesty are sometimes discarded in favour of outward appearance, wealth and the quest for power. I feel that distortion in practice must be confronted and our great ideals must be restored. I believe that drama should be provocative and relevant. I wrote Beshti because I passionately oppose injustice and hypocrisy." End quote. That was Bhatti speaking. However, the setting of a play in a Sikh temple and using some of the artefacts associated with the temple were the principal causes of the perceived offence. Representatives of the Sikh community during the first performance of the play attempted to negotiate with the theatre However, the Birmingham Rep Board of Management refused to bow to pressure. Senior figures within the community made calls early on for the protests in, in the protests for adaptations of the script and for the location of the play to be removed away from a temple and into a community centre. However, neither author nor theatre would budge, and so on the night of 18th of December 2004, approximately 400 members of the Sikh community stormed the theatre, causing extensive damage, the evacuation of 800 spectators, and the closure forever of the play on grounds of public safety, and the author went into hiding after receiving death threats. However, the protests numbered 400 out of <coughs> approximately 600,000 Sikhs living in Britain at the time. As is reported in The Guardian, the reaction among the Sikh community, particularly younger members of the community, was not homogenous. 
For example, playwright and filmmaker Ash Kotak said, quote, the people who are campaigning are the ones who have oppressed us in the first place, the very people we are writing against. These are issues which have to be highlighted, end quote. <coughs> now, the Birmingham Rep issued the following statement in defense of theatrical representation, quote, neither the writer nor the theater is making comment on Sikhism as a faith or the temple as an entity. Equally, the characters in the play are not intended to be representative of the Sikh community. They are works of fiction characterizing the fallibility of human nature and the injustice and hypocrisy that exists in the real world, end quote. That was the defense of Salman Rushdie, in fact, uh, some years earlier. But, in fact, the temple in the play is fictional, um, one built and now extended by the very powerful character, Mr. Sandhu, who exercises control over his community to the point of his ability to abuse in the lair that has become his office is in the temple. Now clearly, as many sociolo sociologists have argued, elites within migrant communities emerge who come to speak for those communities. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, we'll just go back a bit. Um, elites within migrant communities emerge who come to speak for the whole and engage with the elites of the host society. But from the dialogue between those elites and the theatre management, it is clear to see who the elites in the Sikh community were seeing representative of reality, while the role of fiction and imagination having no place within the process of theatrical creation. Now this is actually, I think, far from a reactionary interpretation, given the lack of media representation for such a minority community in the first place, that one of the first and foremost prominent in theatre should be an attack on the hypocrisy of their own community, vying for respect and a place in wider society and in public discourse. This post-imperial reality is interesting from the perspective of censorship. The Birmingham Rep closed the production under guidance of the West Midlands Police on grounds of public order, rather than on any aspect of offensiveness of content. So the closure was not strictly caused by censoring, but more the violent performance of a heightened censoriousness within a community the play it claims to represent. It wasn't until 2010 that Batty's play was revived, but only in an unpublicised rehearsed reading by most of the original cast at the Soho Theatre in London uh, during the run of the theatre's production of Batty's next stage play, Behut, or, which was beyond belief, and that was a dramatic compilation of the events surrounding the early or censored play. Now, news of that reading was only communicated to the theatre goers who were attending the new play, and it, it all passed off without incident. Um, with critics and commentators, uh, you know, six years on, comment, uh, agreeing that the original <coughs> charges of blasphemy against the play as being unjustified. Now, that pl the, the new play, Behood, had earlier opened at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry in the West Midlands, um, and the West Midlands police turned out in force to protect the play during its run um, at a huge cost, uh, at, at huge cost, but at no cost to the theatre. And this might seem indeed as, as if the establishment was rallying in defence of the freedom of artistic expression in the face of religious condemnation. Now, Batty again came under the spotlight in 2013, uh, this time for her BBC Radio 4 drama, Heart of Darkness, about the so-called honour killing of a 16-year-old British Asian Muslim girl. Now, while no controversy ever surrounded this play or its transmission, um, uh, the author revealed afterwards at a conference in the South Bank, actually that's, those are images from Behud, I'm one behind, sorry. Um, while no controversy ever surrounded this play or its transmission, the author revealed afterwards um, at the, in 2013 at a conference in the South Bank entitled Index on Censorship that the issues she had, she had during the writing process, this time from the BBC, and I quote from, from her, she said, a week before recording, I got an email from the producer saying the BBC compliance department had asked them to take lines out. At the end, a character says, there is, no, there is no, so much pressure in our community to look right and to behave right. However, the compliance department came back and said, we don't want to suggest the entire Muslim community condones honour killings. It's an, she says, it's an extraordinary and awful situation. They said the lines were offensive, but they absolutely were not. We live in a fear-ridden culture. Unbelievably, what the compliance department said was, if you can find a factual example of community pressure leading to an honour killing, you can have the line. But it's a drama, a story. It's a crucial part of that story. I was very disappointed given my previous experience of censorship. If you take out the line, the whole thing changes. It's a betrayal of the character and the truth of the unfolding story. That's Batty's version of the event. The, the BBC's official response 
to the request for editing, says, this is a heart-hitting drama about the realities of honour killing in Britain. A single line in the script could be taken to infer that the pressure and motivation to commit such a crime in a family comes from the wider Muslim community, potentially misrepresenting majority British Muslim attitudes to honour killing. Gurpreet Kaur was asked to amend this line in the normal editorial process of script development, end quote. Now, here's a young British Asian woman representing a British Asian community with the broadcasting authority claiming her play was speaking for the community when neither the character nor the author actually claims that. One could say that in both cases, primarily in the Beshti case, that the issue of censoriousness was not an intercultural one at all, given a Sikh woman was writing a play about a Sikh community. What's important to note, I feel, instead, is that the issue of intercultural representation was read as intracultural representation, and the reading of such representation in the white, wider English context of theatre audiences was actually the intercultural. And it was that intercultural reading, rather than the representation, that was at the true heart of the problem. The heart where the post-imperial and diasporic masqueraded as an intercultural um, uh, enigma. Now, I'll come to the issues of censorship in a post-imperial society presently, but I also want to mention a more recent performance in 2014 that never even saw the London stage. Such was the pre-protest against it. Exhibit B, a live art installation about the atrocities of colonialism by white South African performance curator Brett, Brett Bailey of the company Third World Bun Fight. It features a collection of 12 tableaux vivants, there were actually 13 in the British version, some of black actors on plinths representing colonial atrocities, all the while using museum curatorial conventions of evidence in the form of skulls and bones, as well as modern day asylum seekers chained up as found objects or measured by tape, representing, sorry, referencing the racial science of the 19th century. But there are also texts on cards written by the actors who describe their own experiences of racism in contemporary society. The juxtaposition of the replication of the colonial exhibitionist form with the reflections by those replicating it points to how the horrors of colonialism have not been eradicated either from memory or from actuality is both provocative and disturbing. It first opened to critical acclaim at the Vienna Ethnology <laughs> Museum in 2010 as Exhibit A, with specific reference to German colonialism in Africa, and has since toured to several European countries as well as to Russia and Australia. It came to the Interna Edinburgh International Festival in 2014, again to critical acclaim, but its transfer to the Barton Centre for a five-day run was halted by a tidal wave of critical opprobrium from the leaders of minority communities in Britain. An organised campaign from journalist and blogger Sarah Myers on change.org had the most effect, garnering approximately 23,000 clicks and leading to physical protests at the opening of the exhibition. The controversy was also fueled by Bailey himself with social media and the pre-publicity of the exhibition being a human zoo helped to stoke the fires. Once more, here was a production that set up a beshti binary of the white middle class establishment's <coughs> claims of censorship versus minority community critical opinion and protest. Critics argue that instead of critiquing the colonial uh, voyeuristic experience of the human zoo, the exhibit actually replicated the experience in a post-colonial world. Sarah Myers herself reduced the exhibition to a simple binary of white artists controlling black bodies in a neo-colonial manner without irony. The local black performers uh, in this exhibit are, are, are employed locally in each city the production visits, but in London they only, have a th they only had a three-day induction and training process. And thus the temporary exhibit with its three-day training on racism and performance is parachuted into cities and wider communities that already have long-term projects to combat racism in real environments. And so as Carol Arnott and Chokri Benchika point out, it is the transi transitory nature of the exhibit to elite cultural spaces <coughs> itself that fuels the black-white binarism. Ironically though, the London production did not attempt to involve communities, and the black performers employed were actors who saw the closure of the exhibit as an attack on their own ethics and choices as performers. I want to quote from the statement they issued at the closure of the exhibition of the, of, at, on the opening night. It's from the, the black actors themselves. Quote, um, to the 23,000 petitioners who complained that exhibit B objectified human beings, you missed the point. 
This is the 21st century and we believe that everyone has a choice, a right, an entitlement to do or say whatever they deem to be right for them. We, a group of intelligent and informed actors and performers, have been censored and silenced by protesters who truly have an ill-informed and misguided perspective of this significant and informative piece of work. We are appalled, outraged, angry, extremely angry as artists, as human beings. We cannot believe that this is London in 2014. We are appalled that Exhibit B has been cancelled because of the actions of some of the demonstrators. That complete strangers knew what was best for us, for all of us. Our voices and ideas were, not de were deemed not worthy of being shared with the world. That's a truncated version of a very long statement. And just to, to remind you, these are third or fourth generation black actors defending the right to perform their colonial history against verbal protest and threats of physical assault from their own communities, mobilized through social media. So little difference then between this and the Beshti case, albeit within a different uh, minority community. And thus I see a pattern beginning to emerge here with such performances and, and counter-performances, uh, uh, such as protests against them, where artists from minority communities are being attacked for the performance of theirs and their community's histories of representation. But in both instances, it is not the race of the, artist, of the artist or the minority community from which the artist derives that is in question here. What is in question is both the framing, the control and mediation of these cultural events through and by the white establishment in Britain that brought it under the spotlight. While artists have claimed throughout history the right to freedom of expression, the disengagement of large sections of society, particularly of minority communities, from cultural representation in post-imperial societies comes to the fore in these, de these debates. Just who is Exhibit B for exactly? Why does it parachute into a so-called multicultural city without engagement with the community whose history it is representing? Touring these routes of supermodernity in the form of international festivals, Exhibit B it targets a cultural elite rather than a minority community. It is highly doubtful that the protesters against the exhibit had a cultural or historical context within which to place their protest. Their pro protest came um, from that black-white binarism, inaugurated by the pre-publicity, stoked by the director online, and set in stone by the production's lack of planning and engagement mm -hmm. with the sections of society who would be invested in it historically and socially and politically, if not artistically. Calls for freedom of expression must not be naive enough to think that those who protest and contest about that expression also have rights. Such a pre-production binarism inevitably led to an embodied binarism of artist versus protest, protester to the extent, like in Beshti, where art was not censored but removed from public view for fear of civil disturbance and for the protection of the artist. The absence of censorship offered no protection for the artist or, um, or, or for his or her freedom of expression. Its absence, however, was replaced by political correctness, which Janelle Renelt refers to as, quote, the suppression of expression by cognitive assent or social pressure. In other words, it does not usually refer to the exercise of state power, but most often refers to judgments taken about the political and social volatility of expression and a decision to avoid, or not, sensitive or offensive expressions, or to utilize some expressions rather than others in light of a, complete, a competing social good." End quote. Polit political correctness, as Reinhardt points out, is a term weighed down by pejorative <coughs> connotations propagated by the political right for the most part. But in the absence of a, of a system of regulation in a democratic society with a shadow of empire looming large, some awareness of the meaning of art within a given social, political, or religious context should come into play. Political sensitiveness might be a better term to avoid the maligned correct term, and one, must all, and one would, might be more useful when art represents others, particularly in a post-imperial society where dominant cultural forms continue to represent otherness. And so for comparative purposes, I'm going to revert historically to a very similar moment in British theater history where a production that was expected to cause offence to Britain's Muslim community was able to go ahead through the redefinition of the role of the Lord Chamberlain's office, that was the censor, um, as mediator. The production was entitled Mecca. 
um, an Orientalist musical extra extravaganza based on the, an Arabian Nights tale um, by Australian, uh, Australian born actor manager Oscar Ashe, who had dominated the popular stages of London, London's West End for the previous decade and more. Now, the, the production of Mecca had been running very successfully on Broadway in 1920. It ran for almost a year and was only kept off the London stage because Ash had another musical, Chi Chin Chow, that had been running for five years, hugely popular. In, in April 1921, Ash applied to the Lord Chamberlain for a license for Mecca, and it would take an extraordinary six months before the license was finally granted. And uh, you can see the file in the Lord Chamberlain's correspondence files of the British Library. It's one of the thickest files of all the productions in the first half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, so, th so that drew me to that immediately. Uh, it was also um, subject of a media campaign against its license in the Daily Mail. No surprise there. <laughs> um, similar to the online protest against Exhibit B. The first report on the play in the Lord Chamberlain's correspondence files, these are the, the these, in, the, in the office, each, each play was, the play text was submitted, a report was written, and the, uh, the license was granted on the basis of that report. But that first report made no mention of offence to Muslims in the script. But then a letter from Muslim cleric, Malvi Mustafa Khan, he was imam of the working mosque, one of the biggest mosques, it was the biggest mosque in Britain at the time, um, and he was a regular contributor to the monthly review, the, the Islamic Review in Muslim India, that had a wide circulation in and influence on the small but growing population, Muslim population in Britain. Now Khan himself was a well-known Muslim missionary, spreading the word and teaching the, uh, the religious <coughs> legends of Islam, mostly to upper-class Christian England. Um, and he had quite some notable converts, actually. Um, Khan's intervention prompted a further analysis of the play by the Lord Chamberlain's office, specifically in relation to the representation of Mecca and Muslims. Now, while no specific representation or offence is found, the report concludes that the only point, or the only actual point to which I think exception might be taken, is that the pilgrims drink wine. That is, no doubt, merely ignorance of the Mohammedan law. The assumption, therefore, that the play will ignore the feelings and sentiments of the Muslims, etc., is unfounded and ins inspired only by the title. Perhaps this might be changed. Okay, and of course it was changed to Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> a, re a religious site to a great big trading city. No offence at all there. But not before Ash stoked the controversy himself in the Daily Mail by justifying the title on the grounds that Mecca had become a brand name for all kinds of products. For uh, face cream, there was Mecca sugar, there was all sorts. Mecca was a real um, excellent brand name. Nothing to do with religion. Okay, so while Khan, uh, Khan then wrote back and politely thanked the Lord Chamberlain for his invention, but the Lord Chamberlain used the opportunity to consult leading Muslim figures, leading figures in the Muslim community more widely before making a decision on the license. His first stop was Sultan Muhammad Shah, who was the Aga Khan III. Um, he was, of course, educated at Eton and Cambridge and a leading member of the British judiciary, and who gave his assent to the play subject to the title change. But Ash, the, the producer, Oscar Ash, leaked suggestions to the press. He was a great manipulator of the press. Um, that he was intent on using the original title, he was going to ignore the Lord Chamberlain, simply for the purposes of marketing his show. And despite the Lord Chamberlain's request and these leaks, fueled further interventions from London's leading Muslims. The Lord Chamberlain next received a letter from Said Amir, Amir Ali, um, a former leading Muslim lawyer of Bengali descent, and who was a member of the Privy Council, and he established the London Muslim League in 1908. Another letter arrived from Mohammed Rahim, I can't get a photo of him, uh, former president of the Cambridge University Muslim Association, and, uh, and member of the National Liberal Club. Both objected to the title of the play rather than to anything substantive or representational in the play, and wrote deferentially to the Lord Chamberlain in a manner befitting leading members of the educated elite. But what of the wider Muslim community in London? This was relatively small at the time and partially transient and was not perceived to constitute West End theatre goers. The community mostly was composed of sailors and their families who had been recruited initially by the East India Company from Yemen and also uh, from Northern India, um, particular states such as Gujarat, some of whom had settled and opened small mosques or prayer rooms in, in uh, England's major port cities. But by and large, the Muslim community at the time the play was produced was composed of an educated elite and some establishment figures at the time who were well integrated into British society. 
And while many were spreading the word of Islam and seeking the conversion of prominent British citizens, citizens to Islam, all were very supportive of the establishments and its licensing of popular entertainment, such as Mecca slash Cairo. Now, unlike the fundamentalist Christians um, who were writing into the Daily Mail uh, and uh, pleading, pleading with the readers uh, to get the production stopped on the grounds of public decency, I mean, it was a real shock because of perceived public nudity in it, rather than religion, um, the Lord Chamberlain completely ignored them. Now, one could ask if Mecca or Cairo is such a useful counterpoint to Beshti or Exhibit B, given the fact that there is now an estimated 1.4 uh, million Muslims living in Britain, a sizable though still, still a minority, covering a range of social classes and some, with no, and some with no stakes in terms of jobs or prospects in British society. And of course the Muslim community is not the Sikh community and it's not the black British community either. But what is interesting for me is that the Office of Censorship in colonial Britain sought advice and direction from uh, leading Muslim figures with enormous influence in their communities before making a decision, deferring to the singular demand of a change of name for the play before issuing a license. That propriety work in an imperial contest stands in counterpoint to the new and contemporary cultural elites without the framework of a censor's office, who make assumptions of freedom, freedoms of expression mm -hmm. without engaging specifically with the communities for and to whom the art might cause possible offence. It doesn't matter that many of the protest, m protesters in the contemporary cases might never have set foot in a theatre, let alone one housing the performance against which they are protesting. The fact is that the educated and cultural elites in contemporary British society produce work for those elites most of whom are not of the same race, ethnicity or religion that is being represented. And while those artworks might have the intention of representing the shame and the injustice, um, either in, in or against a minority community, the fact that it is a rare representation of the community in wider cultural and social circles in which community is perceived as being shamed. Irony, perspective, critical distance, these are not necessarily transparent to a community who operates and wishes to be represented as a community uh, and represented not as rogue or unrepresentative. This inequity of representation and lack of engagement between cultural and educated elites and their wider communities, all within the frame of a former colonial establishment, inevitably reduces arguments to feelings and feelings to protests into us-them binaries, wrestling matches over the rights to express versus the rights to represent. And thus, intracultural tensions arise in a country such as Britain, in which the artists, my chosen examples, seek to represent religious and relational differences as cultural and social sameness. And where the opponents of such rep representation have no mediation possibilities other than to contest and then ultimately protest. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Our second speaker in this panel is Emily Fuschek. Uh, she's Assistant Professor of English Literature in the Department of Western Languages and Literatures at Boyazachi uh, University in uh, Istanbul. Uh, she received her PhD in Performance Studies in 2010 uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. And her areas of interest include theater and performance studies, French and uh, Francophone. Uh, cultural studies and anthropological approaches to ritual and bodily practices. Her articles have been published in Theatre Journal and Theatre Research International, and a monograph on the relationship between theatre, immigration, and social movements in contemporary France is under contract with Northwestern University Press. From 2010 to 12, uh, she was Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow of the Department of German and Romance Languages and Literatures at Johns Hopkins University. Emily is going to speak today on interculturalism, humanitarianism, intervention, Théâtre du Soleil in Kabul. So I'll jump right in as well, but I just want to briefly say thank you so much to Charlotte for inviting me to this wonderful symposium. So, where interculturalism in European theater and performance is concerned, the Théâtre du Soleil occupies a central position. Founded in 1964 by, uh, by Ariane Mushkin and a group of collaborators studying at the Sorbonne, the group was soon hailed as the latest in a long and rich tradition of French Théâtre Populaire, eventually becoming a company whose sustainability has few parallels in post-war Western Europe. 
Over the years, the company came to be known for opulent productions that staged the Western classics using a blend of international performance traditions. Famous examples of what academic circles would soon label intercultural theater or theater that explicitly blended a host of cultural forms and resources include Les Atrides and Les, uh, the Les Atrides and the Shakespeare cycles. Over the years, the practitioners of these traditions, as has been alluded to, have been absorbed into the fabric of the company, resulting in a troupe whose mix of nationalities and performance cultures is often celebrated for realizing the oft-referenced ideal of politically progressive theater, a practice of hospitality that exceeds theater's content to influence its form. At the same time, it is precisely such practices that have confirmed the company's centrality to what Rick Knowles has called the intercultural wars of the 1980s, Along with Peter Brook's famed and much-traveled 1985 production, The Mahaparata, Nushkin's work has been criticized for engaging in cultural imperialism, producing artistic amalgams that dislodge performance traditions from their cultural context while framing their own work as evidence of a universal artistic humanity. In this paper, I focus on a somewhat tangential Théâtre du Soleil product, directed by company members and affiliates, Un Soleil à Kabul ou plutôt deux, a Sun in Kabul, or rather two, is a documentary that chronicles a series of theater workshops that the company held in Kabul in 2005. Invited to the war-torn Afghani landscape by a local non-governmental organization, members traveled to the city for several weeks and established a workshop where they introduced participants to the Soleil's international performance vocabulary. Whereas this short film is a remarkable chronicle of the daily frustrations, challenges, and rewards that characterize intercultural communication and experimentation, it is equally revelatory of how intercultural practice absorbs the broader political context in which it takes place. Here, the relevant context, I will argue, is French humanitarianism and the cultural dimensions of international aid and intervention. The documentary, I will argue, illustrates moral configurations specific to the world of aid, even as it posits theater as the groundwork through which humanitarianism can express a moral truth. In doing so, Un Soleil à Kabul moves beyond the paradigms of appropriation or contestation, pushing us to reconsider both interculturalism and humanitarianism. So, what is the precise relationship between these two terms? A brief glance at the critical literature that surrounds these practices reveal that both interculturalism and humanitarianism are centrally concerned with the question of universality. Indeed, the universalist strain of intercultural practice, typically associated with the legacies of Peter Brook, Eugenio Barba, Jerzy Grotowski, Ariane Mushkin, has been called to task for engaging in a sort of piecemeal exoticism, borrowing performance aesthetics from non-Western cultures in a way that both capitalizes on the allure of the unfamiliar and frames that allure as evidence of prehistoric human commonalities and drives. Rustam Baruch's critique of Brooks Mahaparata draws attention to the fact that such claims to universality often negate cultural particularity. At the same time, a closer look at the production conditions of such utopic ideals of humanity often reveal organizing principles that are themselves culture-specific, anything but universal. Humanitarianism, meanwhile, comes burdened with its own history of universalist thought generally associated with the moral imperative to quell human suffering universally, humanitarianism as an organized effort has had two parallel careers. First, via religious traditions of charity, and second, as a secular phenomenon institutionalized via international law, the Geneva Convention. The French experience with humanitarianism is a lengthy one, but today the term French humanitarianism is generally taken to refer to the medical humanitarian movements associated with the 1968 generation. Movements like Doctors Without Borders have drawn both popular and critical attention of late, in part because of the modifications that they have made to earlier generations' commitment to neutrality. So that should ring the Red Cross bell for us, for example highlighting what they often term the moral duty of witnessing. I'm summarizing here a very complicated transformation in sensibilities, but suffice to say that the new humanitarian ethic of overt 
partiality has gone hand in hand with the language of universalism. The moral duty of witnessing has been underwritten by a relatively Eurocentric metric of what constitutes suffering as well as what constitutes suffering's remedy. In other words, much like the universalist strain of interculturalism, uh, contemporary French humanitarian discourses reveal a blend of universality and particularity. The terms simply cannot be made to remain in opposition to one another. What I hope to better understand through the specific context of Ensoleil Kabul is how interculturalism and humanitarianism's shared gravitation towards universality results in a theatrical aid project and the moral configurations that underwrite this project's vision of intercultural experimentation and international intervention. Before turning specifically to Ensoleil Kabul, however, it is worth drawing attention to Théâtre du Soleil's broader career in theatrical aid. To clarify, my reference to theatrical humanitarianism is part of a broader categorization that I've been trying to make elsewhere in attempting to delineate a number of commercial and non-commercial performances that took place in Paris at the turn of the 21st century and featured oral testimonies from undocumented immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Part of a far broader landscape, uh, landscape of immigrant theater, for lack of a better term, these performances in particular revealed a discursive repertoire that resonated with those of medical humanitarian movements and aid organizations working on migration. Length restrictions do not permit me a broader elaboration here, but again, suffice to say that the values, ideals, and representative practices of these domains were increasingly influencing both how Parisian artists articulated the capacities they attributed to political art and the explanatory principles they put to use to position themselves in relation to the suffering that they wished to portray. Théâtre du Soleil's foray into humanitarian theater began in 1996. Oops not quite yet, when the members of a movement for undo uh, undocumented immigrants' rights occupied a Paris church with the hope of drawing attention to the French government's increasingly restrictive immigration policies and the growing precarity of undocumented labor. The approximately 300 occupiers were soon evacuated and the company collaborated with then Minister of Health, Leon Schwarzenberg, to move the, company to, the, uh, to move the group to the company's extensive grounds and buildings in the Parisian suburb of Vincennes. The following year, the company produced Essoudin, de Nuit de Veille, a performance that told the story of a fictional troupe of actors from Tibet who arrived in France to perform at their workspace, the Cartoucherie, decided to apply for political asylum and were refused by the French state. The company's interest in asylum eventually resulted in the epic 2003 production, which has already been referenced, Caravan Sarai, a panoramic chronicle of global migration. In short, Théâtre du Soleil had begun experimenting with notions of theatrical compassion, hospitality, and aid long before Un Soleil à Kabul. Yet few documents capture the dynamics of theater as a vehicle of cultural humanitarian intervention, as well as this documentary. Directed by company members Duccio Bellugi Vanuccini, Sergio Canto Sabido, and Philippe Chevalier, the documentary provides a record of the company's 2005 workshop voyage, as I mentioned earlier, to Kabul, Afghanistan. Invited by the Kabul-based and foreign-sponsored Foundation for Culture and Civil Society to lead a series of theater workshops with Afghan actors, company members traveled to the city for several weeks and established an atelier. Following the company's departure, two Soleil actors remained to assist workshop participants with staging Romeo and Juliet. This performance initiated the Afghan theater company Théâtre Afdaab, whose members later visited the Cartoucherie for further training. Indeed, in the final scenes that accompany the documentary's rolling credits, these young Afghan men and women are shown splashing around in the waves off a French coast. The joyful discovery of the ocean by individuals who have grown up in a landlocked nation is presented in the documentary as parallel to their process of theatrical discovery. As minute as they are, these final shots are indicative of a broader and indeed central theme that runs through the documentary. The notion that theatrical practice can provide an opening in lives marred by political instability and violence. In many ways, Ensoleil Kabul represents a departure from the forms of depoliticization and dehistoricization that are often identified as fundamental aspects of humanitarian representation. 
anthropologist Lisa Malki has argued that the discourses of humanitarian intervention often reveal what she calls a dehistoricizing universalism, voiding refugees of their specific political and historical circumstances, presenting them as universal humans caught in a moment of life-altering distress. The participants of the Soleil workshop are hardly presented as members of a universal humanity. Scenes of theatrical learning and its accompanying frustrations are interspersed with scenes of daily life in Kabul, as the camera glides over crowded marketplaces, children hauling water, and an emaciated donkey poking around large piles of debris and waste. Conversations regarding life under the Taliban, particularly for women, permeate the documentary, and the film's implicit message is that what ails Afghanistan are the social and cultural residues of Taliban rule, as opposed to, for example, the effects of the United States-led bombing campaign. What is striking about the documentary's insistence on portraying the particularities of this political context is a parallel depoliticization and dehistoricization of theatrical practice. In Ensoleil Kabul, theater is without borders, to reference the consummate discursive framing of French medical humanitarianism. Theater is a universal good that can cross, according to the documentary, national boundaries unencumbered by political, historical, or cultural particularity. If such an expectation resonates with the historical weight of la mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission, this is a tone set by the documentary itself. In an early scene presenting the personal deliberations of company members on whether or not to travel to Afghanistan, Ariane Nushkin reminds her actors, quote, this is not a tour, it is a mission, unquote. There are multiple ways in which this comment inflects the documentary, but I will draw attention to two here in particular. First, I will draw attention to how the documentary presents theatrical pedagogy as a vehicle for venting outrage at and ultimately altering non-Western cultural practices. Second, I will ask what politics of life, in Didier Fassan's words, characterize the concrete personal risks involved in rendering theatrical humanitarianism a mission. So we will come back to the issues of outrage and shame that, we, that were mentioned in Brian Singleton's presentation. Scenes of actor training, oops, so a brief image here of Romeo and Juliet. Scenes of actor training permeate un soleil à Kabul. In many ways, the documentary is an excellent record of the Soleil's broader philosophy of performance. During one of the feedback sessions following a brief improvisational exercise, one of the participants asks Nushkin how they are to portray a specific emotion, the basic actorly question. The director's offhand reply would seem to resonate with the tendencies of modern realistic actor training in the Euro-American world. Munushkin notes that this emotion is one that the actor needs to find within in order to then manifest in the guise of a character. Yet taken as a whole, the documentary is proof of just how complicated the relationship between inner emotion and outer manifestation can be. In fact, much of the atelier's work is devoted to bodily training. So I want to introduce a brief two-minute video clip here um, to give you a sense of the kinds of activities that the documentary chronicles. C'est simplement ce que j'ai demandé, comme un, comme un turc euh, euh, de l'armée, tu vois Oui Voilà Voilà Regarde Regarde, regarde Regarde-le, regarde, lâche-le Voilà Voilà Bon, alors... Il faut marcher avec ça et la jambe opposée, dans, le, dans la terre, voilà Voilà Il est à
workshop begins with an introduction to the masks worn in Comédia dell'Arte, Balinese, and Japanese theatrical traditions. They then improvise with imbuing these masks with exaggerated bodily stereotypes, as you just saw, and undergo body-altering costume designs, costume changes. When a small turtle is found ambling around the workshop space, Nushkin places him on stage, inviting participants to observe its inner rhythm and sudden jerky movements. The Soleil's approach, in other words, is undergirded by the assumption that the embodiment of an emotional state is the result of repeated engagements with that state's outer form. Physical dexterity is central to the work of the professional actor. It is perhaps not surprising, though, that one of the documentary's most layered and thorniest moments happens in the midst of a conversation on the relationship between outer form and inner sentiment. Referencing the centrality of cross-gender casting in Soleil's practice, as well as in a variety of global performance traditions, Nushkin addresses the workshop's men. And this is a quote that I pulled together from the English language subtitles to the documentary. You should be able to put yourself in the place of a woman who lives here. And if you could, if you really placed yourself, it wouldn't even be an hour. If you put on a chadri, referring to the full body and face covering worn by some Afghan women, one day put on the clothes of a woman, put on a chadri and go out onto the streets for one hour, there you go, that is already the beginning of the work of the actor. You would be ashamed. You would be ashamed. If you, the men, one day you don't say, that's enough, this is a mark of infamy on our forehead, the world's upside down and we place honor where there is only dishonor, who will say it? If it isn't you, the artists, who will have this courage? These comments are revelatory of a number of dynamics. On the one hand, Nushkin's reference to the Chatri and enjoinder to the men that they should be able to put themselves in the place of a woman who lives here is a reference to the possibilities for bodily and emotional experimentation in cross-gender casting. On the other, references to the cultivation of theatrical technique and skill operate as a clear parallel to what Nushkin articulates as the cultivation of a non-theatrical skill, shame in the face of perceived gender inequality. The precise historical, cultural, and political context of the Chadri is absent from this documentary, and indeed, my interest here is not in validating or in critiquing Nushkin's assumption that this practice constitutes a mark of infamy. What interests me here, rather, is the way that the attainment of theatrical expertise serves as the groundwork through which the documentary expresses its own moral truth a commitment to gender equality that manifests itself in particular outer forms. In Ensoleil Kabul, theater is not merely a tool of cultural humanitarianism capable of healing the wounds of political violence. Theater is also the practice through which local participants can cultivate progressive sentiments, joining their aid providers in expressing outrage at and denouncing local practices. Shortly after the above statement, Mushkin adds, quote, this is your role, it is your mission, there is no art without a mission, unquote. The comment parallels the director's opening enjointer to her own actors that their stay in Kabul is a mission, not a mere stop on a theatrical tour. The filmmaker's decision to retain these parallel moments is significant, for to dismiss this documentary as a product of the civilizing mission would be to turn a blind eye to the film's somewhat more subtle attempt that is, to include the targets of this undertaking in the mission itself, thus suggesting that the arts have the potential to disperse the dichotomy between aid provider and aid recipient, joining them through humanitarian outrage. Theatrical interculturalism in this instance is a clear vehicle for moral development. So what do we make of this ethical configuration? Earlier, I had noted that Unsoleil Kabul does not participate in the decontextualizing tendencies of humanitarian representation. It is equally important to note, however, that in scenes such as the one that I just related, cultural, historical, or political particularity, i.e. the broader context necessary to understanding gender dynamics in public life in Kabul in the aftermath of an international military intervention, these details pale next to the weight of a perceived universal moral code. The representation that results may not necessarily revolve around a universal human, but it does presume the power of theater as a universalizing vehicle. As a next step, then, it might be worthwhile to ruminate on the larger power dynamics that structure this theatrical humanitarian intervention, namely the relationship between aid provider, 
the professional theater practitioner, and aid recipient, the amateur actor. In an early scene in Unsoleil Kabul, an early scene in Unsoleil Kabul shows the discussion that took place between Aryan Mushkin and the members of Théâtre du Soleil on whether or not the company ought to travel to Kabul. The resources of the NGO, Foundation for Culture and Civil Society, are limited, and there is confusion over whether or not company members will receive adequate protection while there. Scenes of their discussion are interspersed with shots of newspaper articles reporting the latest bouts of violence in Afghanistan and a brief video excerpt of foreign journalists held at gunpoint. Company members are clearly fearful of wading into the unknown, and it is unclear whether <coughs> Mushkin's announcement of her own participation uh, relieves or further troubles the rest of the company. The documentary's inclusion of these deeply personal negotiations resonates with what Didier Fassin has called humanitarian interventions, quote unquote, politics of life. Fassan uses this phrase to refer to an ethical configuration specific to medical humanitarianism. In his ethnographic account of the discussion that took place in the Doctors Without Borders headquarters in Paris in 2003, Fassan analyzes the manner in which organization members debated the possible conclusion of their work at the time in war-torn Iraq. He notes that as members debated pulling their own non-Iraqi workers from Baghdad, there emerged a complex negotiation between the organization's principle of medical assistance and their assessment of whether such assistance could be done efficaciously given the violent circumstances in the region. Fassan identifies here a contrast between lives that can be quote unquote saved, Iraqi lives, and lives that can be risked, the lives of Doctors Without Borders members. This contrast is important to note because whereas humanitarianism is premised on the equality of suffering regardless of national affiliation, in other words, suffering as a species level experience, moments such as these reveal the very tangible differences in how human life can be valued across geopolitical spaces. The contrast between lives that can be saved and those that can be risked is particularly stark in the context of medical humanitarianism, given the movement's direct ability to influence individuals' biological well-being. Theatrical humanitarianism clearly belongs to a different order of aid. What is worthy of note here, however, is how the only form of risk that the documentary finds in the encounter between Théâtre du Soleil members and Afghan workshop participants are the perils associated with the company's presence on Afghan soil. Mm. Conversely, participation in theatrical activity is portrayed as a salutary and even redemptive phenomenon, entailing little danger for those who participate in it. My goal here is not to suggest that Soleil work, the Soleil workshops were in any way harmful or to discredit their clearly pleasurable dimensions, dimensions that are visible throughout the documentary. My point is simply that whereas theater's psychological benefits are taken for granted throughout the documentary, no effort goes to assessing its psychological after effects. For example, participants are encouraged to stage a comedic version of a scene in which an actor is beaten by the Taliban. The comments that surround the staging clearly indicate that Soleil members find this performance, quote unquote, cathartic. It is less clear how Afghan participants experience this scene. And I have a, another brief excerpt here that I want to show you to give you a sense of the kinds of ambivalence that surrounds these representations. Yeah, Kiva. C'est Oui, 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 la défaite, la défaite. C'est 
C'était très bien et les masques étaient là et c'était magnifique. C'était très beau. C'était très beau, Mariam, c'était très beau aussi. C'était très courageux et très juste et très beau. Merci beaucoup. C'est une belle fin d'une belle journée. Merci bien. C'est bien, c'est bien. C'est bien, Maurice. C'est bien. C'était vraiment la catharse, je vais te dire. Hein. C'était bon. Such ambivalent dynamics were visible to me over the course of a number of interviews that I conducted with the company over their previous theatrical blockbuster, Caravan Sarai. This 2003 production, a migration, refuge, and asylum was based on interviews that company members had conducted as part of a data gathering project that stretched from the then operative Sangat refugee camp outside of Calais to the Villawood Detention Center in Australia. When I inquired as to the particulars of the company members' ethnographic process, one actor stated that the company's presence in refugee camps and the possibility of their story's theatrical representation had given camp inhabitants, in her words, hope, quote unquote. Yet, this actor was equally forthcoming about the fact that most of their interlocutors were unsure what theater was, leading me to wonder if that hopefulness was in fact co-created during the moment of encounter between aid provider and aid recipient. The actor who was my interlocutor never dismissed this ambiguity and was herself fully aware that the power-stricken space between her and her own interlocutor was filled with unspoken confusions and uncertainties. Theatrical risks are equally visible in Unsolea Kabul's depiction of how the theater workshops transitioned from training exercises to the rehearsal of a specific performance. Throughout the documentary, the redemption imagined to be inherent to theatrical participation is linked to the fact of taking part in an ensemble. The workshop underlines collectivity itself as a moral virtue. Mm -hmm. In such a framework, however, the final selection of a set of more competent actors to stage Romeo and Juliet is a delicate affair, and the documentary does not touch on how this experience of an ongoing latent audition is interpreted and experienced by the larger collective of workshop participants. Once again, my goal here is not to undermine the value of such artistic projects, but rather to think with them in understanding what social and political worlds can result from their choices. How might we understand a situation where the form that a particular kind of aid takes, in this case, the aid being theatrical interculturalism itself, is more legible to those providing it than to those receiving it? What are the forms of risk that we are habituated to recognizing in situations such as these? And what does theatrical practices porosity to and ability to function as a vehicle for cultural humanitarian endeavors tell us about the relationship between theater, activism, and politics more broadly? In conclusion, as a very provisional conclusion, I find it important to note that my scholarly interest in this documentary wavers between my not wanting to fall into what Carrie Preston has called easy critical pieties, while nonetheless remaining very wary of the kinds of dynamics that the work chronicles. I'm particularly interested in how Unsolea Kabul might move us beyond cultural appropriation or imperialist exoticism as the central rubrics for scholarship on intercultural theater practice, reaching instead for new models that allow us to interrogate the specific political contexts and frames through which intercultural practice is rendered legible for those who partake in it, to, who participate in it.
To do so, in a sense, is to highlight a dimension of intercultural practice that Jacqueline Lowe and Helen Gilbert drew attention to so long ago. The fact that intercultural theater is a result, and this was a quote mentioned earlier as well, of intentional encounters motivated by voluntarist attitudes. The same can be said with equal precision about humanitarianism. Humanitarian action is intentional human action, underwritten by a premeditated and purposeful vision of aid. Ensoleil Kabul reveals the blend of intentionalities that inform Théâtre du Soleil's vision of artistic voluntarism. I have argued that French humanitarianism provides them with a frame whose universalist legacy mirrors that of intercultural theater and imbues it with a moral configuration that creates new subject positions, new ways of international relating that make certain kinds of human connection possible while foreclosing others. What remains to be thought through then is what new terms we can develop to think through the blend of aesthetics and politics that informs intercultural intentionality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily. Don't go away so quickly. There's time for questions. <laughs> Brian is still available. There he is. Good, good man. So we have an opportunity for 10 minutes plus uh, for some questions and also, I, I guess, to take in comments perhaps for, for any questions for, for Charlotte and Jason as well. So. I hope on the floor, I want to thank you both for uh, two excellent presentations. I think it really brought attention to some of the kind of paradoxes of, of theater, you know, the, the potential for self-contradiction in certain kinds of ways, and also what you really both draw attention to, these, these kind of inequities of legibility, I think was a common th thread between both. So thank you very much. Thoughts, questions, interventions, protests? <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I was, thank you. I mean, this has been so rich, and one is learning so much. Thank you both very, very much. Um, I was thinking about how um, secularism is being negotiated and how it's framing some of the tensions that you're talking about in Kabul uh, and in terms of the censorship that you're dealing with. And uh, you know, in my book, The Politics of Cultural Practice, the, I had inter, intra multi and secularism was the odd man out, I said, the odd person out. Mm -hmm. I'm now beginning to realize maybe that is really at stake today mm -hmm. in Europe, and uh, especially in, after this cartoon controversy where issues around liberties, rights, you know. So <coughs> as scholars, Obviously, we're working within a secular framework, but I'm just wondering how um, our scholarship can perhaps push, uh, you know, some of those frontiers, as you both were doing in, in very different ways. You know. uh, Brian, through your very measured uh, insistence of some kind of, you know, what is the mediation of communities, you know, do we just write them off because they don't go to the theater, so they don't matter, they're ignorant, you know? Um, and what are we doing in the process uh, when we follow, uh, you know, take this hard line approach that, you know, theater has to continue, etc. What is then is the role of the state as protector of rights? You know, when you turn to the police, the police are out there, you know, protect, this has happened now, it's not just in the context of Islam, but with uh, uh, Romeo Castellucci's on concept of the face, you know, where Catholic communities were, you know, up in arms against the way, you know, it's a very complex thing for, uh, for uh, academics, and uh, because my own take on that production, from what I've heard of it, was that it's a very complex production, it's working, you bring up irony, here there's, the, I would say it's a profoundly Catholic work, but for people who have not seen the work, who may not have access to the grammar of that mm -hmm. aesthetics, it could seem blasphemous, in a very offensive way. Mm -hmm. You know, have grenades thrown at the face of Jesus Christ, it's not easy for anybody. Um, so I'm just wondering, I said more of a comment, mm -hmm. like, you know, that secularism is, and in Kabul, you know, like, I was uncomfortable just looking at the Comedia, 
you know, which Aaron Pushkin is so happy about. You know, for her it's cathartic. But uh, we didn't have enough visual evidence or uh, what is it, and you've asked the most valid question, how is it being processed for the people watching it? So these were some, thank you so much, oh. very rich. Did you, want, did you want to comment, either of you, on, on that? I, I, I do like that idea of the, the um, access to grammar. Mm. I think mean, that's something that we need yes. to keep in mind. I mean, I was, I, you know, I was, I, was re I, I think the route for me certainly is going to the secular. I mean, in, in this mm. regard, you know, when, when I'm writing this, I'm going back to what you wrote about mm. many years ago now. Mm. Um, in relation to, I, I, I've seen the video in full. Um, the, I mean, there's a quite a long section in the early, but we only showed a snapshot of that early bit where they're introduced to the comedian masks. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of performance of failure mm -hmm. in the first half of the documentary where the Afghans are failing. Mm -hmm. And I've, I, that's, that's where I found it very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, it was almost as if, um, and of course I love Michigan's work dearly, don't get me wrong, uh, but it's almost as if she's trying to re make a, a, an Afghan model of herself, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Nice. which I see is probably huge. Yeah. No, I, there's there's no subtlety around that suggestion, yeah. right? Um, this is meant to be a kind of diasporic offshoot of mm. the theatre of the sun, right? A sun in Kabul. Mm -hmm. um, no, absolutely. And of course, then they perform back to the, through the migrants' routes, back at the Katashiri, They're invited back to perform yes. yeah. these uh, satellites from around the world mm. to kind of globalize Soleil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mud a little bit of Pina Bausch and, and uh, Bamboo and her attempts in a, in a different mm -hmm. kind of dance form to achieve similar effects. But, you know, mm -hmm. Emma, do you want to comment? No? In terms of what's happening in French cultural politics right now and what has been happening in Mushkin's work for a long time, there is absolutely no recognition around the fact that secularism is a very historically specific yeah. political formation, right? That it belongs to a particular geography and that it is attached to a particular history that includes colonialism in all of its various entanglements. So, um, so in terms of a kind of nuanced understanding of what secular, uh, secularism mm -hmm. might be, my sense is that you're not going to be finding it in these right. kinds of cultural products. Mm -hmm. um, and even the language surrounding Charlie Hebdo, I think, was very, very limited in terms of understanding mm -hmm. how legal loopholes in um, in French law actually make it possible for certain artists to be castigated for inciting racial hatred, yes. like mm -hmm. Dieudonné, and others to be celebrated as icons of freedom of expression, like mm -hmm. the um, now deceased artists at Charlie d'Ecto. So that discussion, I think, is very, very much missing. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really yeah. good point, sure. that the, to put those Dieudonné together. Right. With and within Shall a week you? of one another, know, right? Yeah. Because yeah. he's castigated. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes? I found that first session uh, amazing. It was really informative. I learned a lot from it. The only thing is that it seems to uh, be geared towards the whole professional side of theatre rather than it has didn't mention uh, Gustav Boal, it didn't mention Theatre the Oppressed. Uh, the many uh, people within the whole area of theatre, uh, like uh, Sanjay Goyla uh, in India, uh, St. Christie, uh, one of the largest theatre companies in the world. Um, it's, it's looking at the whole area of playwrights, act, professional playwrights, professional actors and so on. It's not looking at the work that people are doing in getting people from within the communities to develop their own theatre piece and perform that. Yeah. Uh, and then the interaction of the audience with the theatre. Mm -hmm. um, internationally, in, in Ireland, there are many uh, very good theatre of the oppressed um, yeah. organisations. Yeah. And namely, one of our own is ALA. Uh, and um, Day in the Life of an Asylum Seeker is an, an mm. example of um, of people developing their own piece and performing that and putting it on stage. Yeah, did, did you wish to yeah, comment on that? Simply, this is the paper that I'm working on for this conference. Stick around for the rest of the week and <laughs> yes. they hear one of those papers. I mean, I, I totally work, on, my other work is on animal productions in Dublin, mm. totally working with in communities 
for communities emerging from the communities, including uh, migrants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just this is just one aspect of the work. If you're here, just stick around. Oh, so <laughs> I the wrong one then. <laughs> sure, I'm not. Okay. No, no. I mean, Emily, you were very much looking yeah. at the intersection between what does it mean for a professional mm -hmm. company to try yeah. to absorb amateur actors and then professionalize mm -hmm. them through that mm -hmm. that process. Of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily professionalize uh, amateur actors. Right. Take them as they are and let them learn how to develop their own uh, stories and yeah. perform those stories. I think I'm, I'm finding myself constantly in a position of saying something and then disclaiming it, right? The professional <laughs> situation of the person who wants to think about interculturalism. And I think your point goes to that in that just because there are significant kinds of challenges or conflicts involved in this process doesn't mean that there aren't rich affective bonds that mm -hmm. the participants form, right? With the process, with the individuals, with the company members in that process. So how can we develop a framework that still allows us to acknowledge that human experience mm -hmm. without at the same time not losing sight of the fact that there are significant political challenges involved in this process? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think this raises really interesting um, questions and I, I was thinking to Andrew Paper of how many parallels there are with theatre for development projects. Yes, and theatre for development is seen as not really theatre often because of the aesthetic. The aesthetic is often a poor aesthetic. But the, many of the problems are the same problems that are, we are engaging with in interculturalism. Um, and the, the majorly coming in with an agenda, coming in with an aesthetic, um, in the notion of empowering people with a certain morality. So I think that, that a lot of the questions we're talking about are inflected, but often we don't bring together the kind of developmental practitioners with the interculturalists, and that might be worth a conversation. Um, and, and the other thing is that a lot of what was being spoken about earlier about utopia and mm. refugees, um, that idea of division of hope, which is often created for those of us that feel guilty. And the idea of shame and guilt, which of course was a problem of Bailey's piece, because he's speaking to white guilt. His audience, his projected audience, were white. And he was not creating that work for the local community. But of course, when it explodes, because those people don't have it, and indeed in London particularly, I was there, I was part of that thing, the, the real protests were not from the African diaspora, it was from the Caribbean. Okay. Because right. the slavery, the whole notion of slavery, and the, and the way Africa was implicated in slavery, was completely disavowed. So it was a double whammy for the Caribbean community. Yeah, Sarah is from Jamaica. Yeah, and, Jamaica. There was, and there was an in, there was a kind of intracultural conflict between mm. the Africans and the Caribbeans, mm -hmm. which went online, and the African artists from Africa were defending the work. Right. So there was a kind of black conflict internally mm -hmm. going on, which was incredibly interesting, but that wasn't the intended audience for the work. So there are these layers of mm -hmm. history, and I think, Brian, your paper on the past is really important. We can't move on mm -hmm. if we don't look back. Yeah. We're trapped in, we're, but we're still, I think Britain is still trapped in that colonial moment. Mm -hmm. of um, not, not knowing how to deal with uh, the non-white community. We have, we're slightly running out of time, so what I suggest is we might take some comments or, or in the form of questions and then we'll sort of, you know, see. I, I think you maybe had a, had a, no? Okay. Exactly. We have conflict of interest here. So, um, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Um, I, I think it's just a really brief comment, really, because mm. along with secularism, which I think post 9/11 and 77, God is back on the table. Uh -huh. it, it becomes one of the most urgent issues, and I completely agree with Bruce, and that that's something that really appealed to me, but. Uh, I think the other issue for me was that came out of both of your papers was uh, the issue of paternalism and the state's uh, paternalism. Also, it reminds me of what Viku Parikh talked about multiculturalism and then he talked about colonialism and the colonial powers as uh, being parent parental despots. And that kind of parental despotism is, I mean, when I was looking at the Nushkin video, I, it made me sort of really deeply uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and I heard you talk about Franco Bree's work as well. I think it's it's that sense of you're broken and we'll fix you. But that brokenness is never ours. And That's the key thing to Besti, 
the, the conflict of Bechti was about the parental despot yeah. of the Sikh community. Mm -hmm. it, was kind of it was almost like a colonial transference mm -hmm. uh, of power. Like the, mm -hmm. uh, so the parental despot is the one that caused the offence. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is what is the form of that brokenness, right? Again, what kind of a lens do we use by which we identify a brokenness in terms of gender relations, but do not identify the brokenness of an international bombing campaign, right? Mm -hmm. How is it that we are able to identify certain forms of suffering as universally um, does, uh, requiring of our moral outrage, and other forms as parts of, like, negligible parts of international politics, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the developmentalism connection is important, too. What are the repertoires of legible suffering that these different mm -hmm. contexts bring to bear on human life? Yes? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was thinking that the three presentations have in common, that somehow these intercultural events are not honoring what somehow an intercultural frame of mind demands, in the sense that you know, they talk in fiction that you, you have this suspension of disbelief, but there's something about intercultural relations, right? it's about suspension of belief. You have to stop believing that you know who you are. You have to stop believing that things are defined. Mm -hmm. and you have to join again that emergent moment they were mm -hmm. talking about. But I didn't see in any of these productions an effort to dismantle the pedagogical frame that implies that there's someone here that already knows yeah. Yeah. and everybody else has to learn. And um, my question would be, can you provide any examples of a structure in which that be, it, it is recognized that we are here, we, we don't know where we're going, we don't know what we're going to do. You have to accept that you are not, you don't know exactly what Irish is, and I have to accept that I don't know exactly what being Kabul is, and we can start from that dismantlement of that power structure. So. For example, I would like to know, I mean, who made the decisions of, and how those decisions were made to produce that particular play, who was paying for it, how an infrastructure that is never revealed was there, somehow pulling the strings that made the intercultural moment ineffective to a certain extent. Because it's a very difficult thing to do. You have to accept that you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Which for academics is very hard. To be careful. Well, one of the interesting things about this documentary, another moment that I debated showing you, except it, it felt like it would be like too much like hitting you over the head with it, is a moment where Mushkin, in preparing her actors to meet the, um, the Afghan workshop participants, actually says something along the lines of, well, we are not bringing them universal theater, we're bringing them the theater of our company. Well, we know that, that we're bringing them universal theater, but they don't need to know that. Uh, so, <laughs> so, why would you, um, but, you know, like, beyond the kind of knee-jerk reaction where we're like, oh, how politically incorrect, why would you include this moment in the documentary, right? This is something they could easily edit out, but it's almost as though they're working with the base assumption that someone knowing is the necessary condition yes. for exchange, yes. and that Right, I'm not sure that I come across too many cultural products that disavow that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we might just have a couple of other quick ones. And, uh, I would just say quickly, so. in an Irish context, Leo, I think what really interests me about the interculturalism as state discourse is that it's trying to say we can remake, we can remantle, we can like dismantle and put it back together, right? But then through the Playboy example, that's a very clear top-down situation, even though the emergent, you know, BC's company, one of their first productions they did before they, you know, came together as a company was a play called Once Upon a Time and Not So Long Ago, a pair of works which was group devised and, and involved different African communities living in Ireland, as well as some Irish scenarios. So there was, you know, through that work, the attempt Polish Theatre Ireland, although it's a company that's looking specifically at the intersection between Irish and Polish theater, you know, they did a work called Czesław Miłosz, which involved uh, several, I think, Lithuanian, Polish, Irish uh, um, actors and, and playing around with language. I, I would also point to dance. I mean, I think that John Scott's company, Irish Modern Dance Theater, did a piece called Fallen or Cover, where he worked with center for, uh, survivors from the center survivors from the Center for Survivors of Torture, um, and he's interviewed in me and Matt's book, and they made a piece that was not about asylum, it was, it was you know, a much more abstract kind of piece, and in those spaces we see a different kind of identity, and he then absorbed those people into his professional company. So, you know, there, there's emergent things, but, you know, so often we fall back on that structure that you're speaking to, absolutely. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a very, very, very quick one, and I think it's fully articulated, but uh, I, I just wanted to say thank you again and to, to come back to the notion of intentionality and intentionality as well as the point of exchange. That which we, we want to say, this is where all my exchange is based upon. And I think that the, the relationship that you're doing, particularly with uh, Doctors Without Frontiers, um, this humanitarian approach is actually quite telling, because it could be done back to the idea of a truism. Why we can be the medicine that the Doctors Without Frontiers works? because medicine is good, because we know that scientifically mm -hmm. proven it is actually works mm -hmm. and operates mm -hmm. as a true medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. So it has to operate like that. Mm -hmm. So operating again mm -hmm. with theater, this is a theater that works. So it has a notion of not only political implications, aesthetic mm -hmm. implications, saying this is a theater that works. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we bring you a universal theater. Yes. We are opening you with the eyes to, to, to that world of experience. We're showing you the sea, mm -hmm. which can be known, which will not have that, cannot be known the ability or the skill to go into something. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we might close there in the interest of time. Thank you very much. So you've all been great in a two hour and 20 minutes.